So today we're going to make tetradecyl phosphonic acid, which is used to make bright cadmium selenide quantum dots. And to do that, we're going to use the following reagents. And we're going to use air-free techniques and air-free glassware, like you're about to see here. In the round bottom, we've already added the dry hexane and sodium cubes. We have an additional funnel, and the system's under nitrogen. We have a reflux condenser. We don't need to cool that with water because we're going to be refluxing hexane, and that does not need uh, to be water cooled. Air will cool it uh, well enough, and I know that through experience. And the whole system is connected to a Schlink line to provide dry, oxygen free nitrogen gas. You can see the sodium cubes at the bottom there. The next step is to add the dibutyl phosphite, and we have to be careful at the very beginning because the needle cover tends to catch a bit, and you have a reflux that when your hand jerks uh, open, y your hand tends to jerk back, and so you can stab yourself with the needle if you're not careful. We also use a narrow 21 gauge needle, and that's so that when you inject into the addition funnel through the rubber septa, that the rubber septa doesn't get torn. Uh, if it gets torn, you're going to let air into the system, so that assures that's not going to happen. And the hard part is turning that stopcock to just the right spot such that you don't uh, flow too quickly or too slowly. And make certain you don't add the liquid with the stopcock in the open position. That's a common mistake. Here I'll uh, zoom in and you can see that we have about one drip per second. That's about how I like to do it. And you see uh, the dibutyl phosphide dripping into the hexane with the sodium. And after a little bit of time you can see that the sodium is starting to react reacting a little bit more. You see that the uh, hexane is refluxing but moderately so I don't like to work with a very violent reflux and you can just you can see that by how slowly the hexane is dripping from the condenser and after um, about three to five hours you can see that the sodium has reacted. That, that little bit of whiteness there is probably some sodium hydroxide because we probably didn't have completely water-free solvent. Okay the next step is to add the uh, bromo tetradecane and again we've uh, we're going to do that through the septum in the addition funnel and this material is like molasses so it's actually slightly easier to get it to drip in slowly it takes a little bit longer to inject into the uh, addition funnel here and we're going to add this in several portions because uh, we're actually adding a lot of material at once so we just fill up the addition funnel, drip it in, and then recharge it. Again, slow but sure. Keep an eye on it, and uh, the stopcock can sometimes jerk a little bit, and it's just one reason that you have to have experience doing this to get it just right. And again, I'll show you uh, the slow drip, about one drip per second, as the uh, alkyl component drips into the activated dibutyl phosphite. And you can see that the hexane, again, is moderately refluxing. Now, it doesn't take very long before you can tell that a reaction is occurring uh, by the formation of sodium bromide, and that's the white powder that you now see in the hexane. And I usually let this go for a little bit longer than the paper says. Uh, regardless, after the reaction is complete, the first thing you need to do is separate out the sodium bromide. Uh, you need very much need to do that or it's going to be very difficult to get rid of completely later. The next step is to remove any possible residual sodium bromide with an aqueous wash. So that's just DI water we're pouring in. And unfortunately the product is an amphiphile. It's basically soap. And that means that the separation is actually difficult. And that's because the aqueous layer uh, is going to form an emulsion and when you try to remove the aqueous layer you're going to actually end up removing a lot of product and you don't want that. So you need the best separation possible. Two tricks there. For one, add a lot of water. Adding more water helps. And so you see we've added a fairly large amount of water and the solution actually at first turns clear and then a little bit later you see it turns cloudy and that's the emulsion forming. And here we're using a separation funnel and we've sped up time a little bit so you can see how the water and uh, products separate over time. This definitely helps to get a good separation. And then we take the hexane product layer on top and dry that further under vacuum. You can tell when it's done when it stops bubbling like you see here. The next up is the HCl reflux. You have to use concentrated hydrochloric acid here because phosphonic acid uh, esters are much stronger than carboxylic acid esters. So unfortunately you have to use concentrated HCl. Here we are caref carefully adding the right amount into the round bottom with the product. 
and it's hard to see here but they don't actually mix too well and another thing we're going to do because we're going to be refluxing essentially a liquid we have uh, the condenser connected to a water cooling jacket you, you absolutely need to do that and the output of the condenser is connected to this drying tube this is done to prevent HCL fumes from getting all over the hood if you don't do this you are going to really do a lot of damage to your hood. HCL vapors will go everywhere and just ruin anything made of metal. That and you, you can breathe in the vapors if you're not careful. Okay, so at, again at first the product does not mix with the water but as the reflex starts to to happen you can see the condensation in the condenser. The the reaction does occur. The um, a byproduct is uh, butanol and butyl chloride and that actually starts to float on top so those are byproducts there and so then what you do is you then add uh, a little apparatus as, as, like we, we've done here to get the uh, HCl liquid to um, basically boil off it's actually fairly safe because most of, most of the HCl is actually reacted so the vapors are not really hardly acidic at all so it's not particularly dangerous and you're not going to gas yourself okay you can't fully remove all the byproduct liquid again um, acidic but but not very strongly so so we take the product out uh, try to break up the cake that forms and you may have noticed that there's some liquid at the bottom yeah, at this point the name of the game is to get all the the slightly acidic water out because when you're making quantum dots you don't want any water let alone any acid water into the mix so we've broken it up, decanted some of that water out, but uh, to help get rid of the HCl, what little HCl remains, we're going to give it a couple of washes with deionized water. And we're going to do that several times until the DI water is moderately acidic, say pH 4, pH 5, and this is going to take a while. And we add water and we break it up. And here you see what's happened after we've done several washes has a slightly metallic color at this point I'm not sure why and again to make certain I get rid of as much water as possible I'm gonna use a Buchner funnel to try to set, isolate the product as much as possible and get rid, of, get rid of as much water as possible as you're about to see right here I go very slowly at first I'm, I'm being a little stingy here because this material is very difficult to make. As much as this has seemed quite fast, this this took us an entire week to to make this batch of phosphonic acid. So again, I go very slowly at first to get rid of most of the water, and then I add uh, the remainder in portions again, just to try to get as much water out as possible. And you're by no means done, by the way. We have two more steps. For one, again, it is imperative to get rid of all the water, so we're going to have to do that under vacuum. So we melt the material and get it into a round bottom flask and attach that, attach that to the vacuum in our slink line. And when you hit vacuum, you have to be really careful. Again, this stuff is soapy, and like soap, it's going to bubble up when you put it under vacuum. If you're not careful, this stuff will completely shoot down the line, losing a lot of product and giving you a lot to do in terms of cleaning. It is not easy to clean this stuff up. You see here I got a little impatient right about here and uh, there we go I almost overdid it but I caught myself just the right moment and backed up on the vacuum once it's done degassing you then need to melt the product because it, it just basically locks water into place so you're gonna have to liquefy it and you can see the water boiling out as the product starts to melt and that just shows you there really is a lot of water locked into the cake of the product and go very slowly here. Um, remember when two liquids are mixed you don't know what the boiling point is so again go very slowly. Once everything has melted and all the water has evaporated you can see exactly how pure is this material. It looked nice and white. It is not so you need to recrystallize the product with hexane and here I haven't added enough hexane. You need to add three or four times as much hexane as product that you have to get a good recrystallization. So what I've done here uh, didn't work too well. I had later had to add more hexane. Regardless, you get everything to melt. Just turn off the heat. You don't have to cool it down. Just let it cool to room temperature and the, the product will recrystallize on its own. And you have to do this two, three, four times easily until you can see that the hexane has no longer got any discoloration. As you can see here, I'm finally done with the recrystallizations. You can see that the product is extremely snow white and the liquid is also not discolored, so the product purity is very, very high at this point. 
and be careful not to let the product go over to the sides of the funnel um, you're going to lose product that way again uh, it's precious given the amount of time that was spent and we do this in portions and here is uh, we're going to show you about half the material we made the total cost of the material that we synthesized is about twenty thousand dollars which we made for about only one hundred dollars so i hope you enjoy um, the synthesis and hopefully you can make your own tetradecal phosphonic acid much much less expensive than buying it and make great quantum dots which we're going to show you how to do in another tutorial which we're going to post shortly